one. Okay. Are you guys ready for some horrors? Everything changed when the slaver nation attacked. What used to be a thriving colony is now a captured country. Slaves do the work, serving their new masters until they die, only to be replaced by new victims harvested in brutal raids. But let's go back to the beginning. The world war of the ants is claiming millions of lives every day. But in the brutal world of ants, straight up war no, is not the only How are you? Around 50 ant species practice slavery, the, the most extreme division of labor. We don't know how this began, but some ant species perfected this cruel trade. Meet Polyergus, the most intense of the slaver ant tribes. There are different species, but generally they're four to 10 millimeters long with brown to blackish bodies and sickle-shaped mandibles. Polyergus has specialized in slavery so much that they've lost their ability to care for themselves. They don't clean, build nests, care for their brood, or feed themselves. <sighs> they only exist for raiding. Slaves make up 80 to 90% of the ants in their colonies, so a few hundred polyergus and a single queen control thousands of slave ants. We'll summarize and simplify what we know about polyergus into one grand story. You can find more information in our sources. So now, let's witness the cruel banality of nature. The raid. It all begins on a mild summer morning on a sunny field. Witness this colony of over 10,000 oh. formica ants, genetically cousins I don't like ants. who build a thriving nest underground. Hi, they are a widespread genus. Some species are good fighters, some great builders, and some cattle farmers. Often welcomed by humans because they hunt vermin that hurt forests. Nobody noticed the lone Polyoga scout that briefly showed up this morning before she bolted away again. The attack begins in the early afternoon. The scout returned from her mission to find the Formica nests. She dances erratically and spreads pheromones that excite and mass recruit oh. more and more ants until a large raiding party of a thousand warrior S's has formed. A close pack well up to 10 meters long begins to move. As the Polyergus raiding party arrives at the Formica colony, the attack begins almost immediately. Dozens of attackers begin digging and clearing up debris from the nest's entrance to make it easier to storm. As soon as they're done, hundreds of the attackers rush inside. The defenders vastly outnumber their attackers and are formidable warriors able to shoot at it. Oh. But instead of fighting back effectively, they seem confused and scatter rather than fighting back. Oh. Polyergus also seems to be somewhat resistant to the acid sprays of the defenders. And so even if a defense is forming, the attackers use their mandibles to pierce and kill. There are a few um, different me. ideas as to why Polyergus attacks are so efficient, and one of the most fascinating ones is chemical warfare. Instead of relying oh. on brute force, they release a propaganda pheromone that makes the defenders panic, unable to mount an organized defense. The attackers have nothing to gain from intense ant-to-ant -ant combat other than immense casualties. What's more, they actually want their victims to survive so that they can be raided again in a few weeks. As the raid Wait, unfolds, why do they raid them? the attackers the reach deep into the colony, looking for their most valuable possession, the colonist babies. Oh. They grab the pupae and larvae well, the that will make up the next generation of Formica and carry them out of the nest. Hundreds are abducted and brought back to the Polyergus colony oh. in this raid alone. Well, most of them. A few unlucky ones are eaten as a sort of snack. The surviving Yummy. victims will be turned into slaves. After about an hour, oh. the raid is over and the Formica can begin to recover. It seems their only strategy is to make even more ants. A decent-sized colony can forfeit thousands of pupae in a single raiding season and still survive. Although in this case, while the raid was going on, something even more sinister happened. Hold that thought though, because how are Polyergus turning ants into slaves? How to brainwash ant slaves. Ants conquered almost the entire planet over 100 million years ago. They owe their success to being social animals that perfected chemical communication. Chemical signals and cues <laughs> let ants know what their colony needs Come on, and what please. each individual should do. And most importantly in this case, 
Who is a friend or foe? Slave-making ants are much less social than other ant species. Some species miss a lot of the genes other ants have to make communication possible. In a sense, they are bad at talking to each other. Oh. So it may be that as Polyergus ancestors started to abduct other ants, they lost the ability to collaborate and work together productively. Soon after the stolen formica offspring have been brought to the slaver colony, they are progressively <laughs> covered in polyergus <laughs> They are chemically imprinted, similar to a oh. duckling who imprints on its mother after birth. Look at this boy right when the here. new slaves what? hatch, they behave as though they are part of the polyergus colony and begin to work for them unconditionally, keeping the nest clean, caring for the next generation of slaves and masters, hunting for food, yeah. and feeding their enslavers mouth to mouth. Uh, this sort of brainwashing goes so far that if they encounter free formica ants in the wild, they will treat them as enemies. In a sense, they're not true slaves, as they serve willingly and show no interest in freedom. Oh. It's more like violent abduction and adoption, which doesn't make oh. things that much better. And as the Formica only live for a few months, a constant new supply of victims is I'm necessary. Doing good. How are you? To survive, Polyergus can never stop enslaving. How to make new slave colonies. How are new Polyergus colonies created? After all, Polyergus workers are so useless that a queen can't start a new colony without slaves. But how does she make slaves without warriors? Thomas it turns out a lot, there are two way. main strategies. The more dangerous one might unfold during a raid like the one we witnessed before. A young Polyogus queen silently follows the raiding party. Using the chaos of the invasion, she's able to find her way to the Formica queen and kill her, taking over the shaken colony. Thank God Although, you're doing good. such a victory may be very short-lived, Polyogus do not tolerate other slaver colonies within their hunting ground. They raid each other fiercely too, and can destroy the competing colonies nearby. So while this tactic sometimes works, it is pretty dangerous. Another young queen is going for a different strategy. She's looking for a Formica Ooh. colony that is further from her birthplace, attacking a whole colony on her own. She bolts through an entrance, pushing aside oh, confused ants that try to stop her, releasing a powerful appeasement pheromone that drives defenders away. She has only a short time window to find the Formica queen deep in the hostile nest. Once oh. she finds her target, My both queens now. engage in a fight to the death. The Polyergus queen is well equipped with her sharp mandibles. She doing, bites Thomas? and rips into her victim for about <laughs> half an hour before she finally calms down. Between her bites, she licks the chemical surface of the dead Formica queen, covering herself in her pheromones. When she's done with this macabre ritual, Formica workers approach her. Subdued by her intense smells, mm. they start grooming and feeding her as though pledging oh. their allegiance to their new ruler. She still might not be done though. Formica colonies often have multiple queens who all need to be defeated, which is not guaranteed. Often, attacking queens will be stopped by a phalanx of workers that rip her apart or are defeated in royal battle. But if she does manage to kill all the queens, the colony has been taken over and the enslaved brood will begin to serve a new queen, the usurper. She now begins laying hey, eggs that are cared for by her new slaves until new polyergus ants Thomas hatch that it. will soon start new raids on neighboring colonies. Whoa, no thank you, Nichols. Do, Sorry, Tom was on top of the making void. The war of the ants is raging with uh, wild and horrible strategies yeah, fought Thomas. by billions of individuals every single day. Polyergus will continue Whoa, to hunt for slaves as to stop raiding would be their demise. And in the war of the ants, there is hey, no there go, giving Thomas. up. There you go. Good boy. We want to explore even more ant species in videos to come. But not just ants. Our planet has so many more wonders to marvel at and learn about. That is, if we you manage to preserve the habitat head, and turn the tide on climate change. Something we're very passionate about at Kotzkazant and have covered extensively in past videos. <laughs> We've found a partner to turn our dedication into action. We'll pay to offset one month of your carbon emissions with the help of our friends from REN. By visiting you buy the water, and everything gets more diesel, and how it can find out your carbon footprint. So still your up a little first bit. step should be to reduce your footprint, but there are limits to that. Ren lets you offset the rest of your carbon footprint with a monthly subscription that supports projects that. Okay, the rest of this is just an ad, so I'll just go to the next one because it's probably going to be the same ad at the end of this one. Mars is a disappointing Mars. hellhole, lacking practically everything we need to stay alive. 
It looks like Good we'll morning, only ever have small crews spend a miserable time hidden underground. Except we could terraform it into Hello. a green Good new morning. world. But to solve the planet's problems, we first need to make it worse and turn it into oceans of lava with gigantic oh. lasers. This isn't Neither. a far-fetched science fiction tale. Terraforming Mars is possible on the kind of timescale our ancestors built great monuments in. If humanity solves some of its pressing problems and ventures into space to expand into the solar system, this may not be that far off. Okay, so how do we terraform Mars quickly? Well, it's complicated. Bum, 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 bum. We have a lot of these to catch up on. <laughs> Mars is dry and has no soil to grow anything. Else? Its atmosphere is too thin to breathe or protect us from radiation, giving you a high risk of cancer. So to turn it into a new home for oh, humanity, we have to give it a good. proper atmosphere similar to Earth's. It should be made of 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen, and a tiny bit of CO2, as an average temperature of 14 degrees Celsius and under one bar of pressure. We have to create oceans and rivers, and then the ground has to be weathered into fertile soil to host living things. Then we need to install a biosphere on the surface and prevent it all from being undone by installing protective measures that can stand the test of time. Oh. It is difficult, but a big laser makes it a lot easier. Laser. Challenge 1. The atmosphere. Some 4 billion years ago, Mars had a nice oxygen-rich atmosphere and was home to vast oceans and rivers. It held onto it for several hundred million years before it got blown away. Ultraviolet rays oh. broke down the atmospheric gases and then the oceans until they were swept away by solar wind. Today, Mars is a dry, barren wasteland. Sounds gonna happen to us, right? Luckily, a sizable portion of the water is frozen in deep like reservoirs and in the polar ice caps, enough to create a very shallow ocean. The Martians and will be enormous happy amounts it? of oxygen are bound as they minerals in the Martian lasers? rocks, like the oxygen in the iron oxides that give the planet its rust red color, as well as carbon dioxide in carbonates. To free these gases, we if need we, to reverse if the we move to Mars, by using If we move to Mars and if we live there, are we Martians? Molasses, which occurs at temperatures as high as on the surface of the Sun. In short, we want to melt the surface of Mars. The best way to do that would be to put lasers in orbit, aiming their beams down on Mars. Neat, the I most powerful be a Martian. laser today is the Eli-NP, able to produce beams of 10 petawatts Duck. of power for a trillionth of a second. To melt Mars, we need a laser twice as powerful that runs continuously. The easiest way is to use a solar-pumped laser that can be powered directly with sunlight. At its core are metal-infused glass rods that absorb energy and well, release so it as a laser beam. Strictly, if we build an array of mirrors in space about 11 times the size of the United States, I think it'll be longer than a day. States, <laughs> we can focus enough sunlight onto them to melt Mars. Mm. Let's do it. As yes. the lasers hit the surface, about 750 I kilograms game of like oxygen this. and some carbon dioxide emerge from every cubic meter of rock melted. If we are efficient, our lasers only need never to be melt through the top eight sand. meters of the surface to get enough oxygen. It would look terrifying. The skies would be shrouded in storms, while the ground would glow red hot, crisscrossed by currents of lava. Tireless laser beams sweep over mm. the landscape, leaving trails too bright to look at. After they pass, the ground cools quickly. A strange snow falls. The ashes from all the elements that solidify as they cool down, like silicon and iron. Mars is still a cold planet at this point. A happy side effect of this inferno is that all the water in the polar ice caps and even deep underground rises into the sky as hot steam, forming clouds that ah. rain down over the entire planet. They would wash out the nastier gases from the atmosphere like chlorine and carry away harmful elements that accumulated on the surface. In the end, they would form shallow oceans, saltier than on Earth. We might need to do an extra cleanup afterwards. Salty. It would take about 50 years oh. of continuous lasering to create our oxygen atmosphere. We could use this opportunity to dig time. deeper in some places to create the basins for salty oceans or rivers and spare some landmark features like Olympus Mons well, this and Venus Marineris. We're not done though. The resulting atmosphere is nearly 100% oxygen and only 0.2 bar. It's hard to breathe and very flammable. To make it similar to Earth and a lot safer, we need to add a lot of nitrogen, which Mars is sadly lacking. We have to import it. The ideal source is Titan, a large moon of Saturn, covered in a thick atmosphere that's almost entirely nitrogen. 
We just have to move 3,000 trillion tons from the outer solar system to Mars. While uh, that's not easy, it is doable. To process that much of Titan's atmosphere, we have to construct giant automated factories on its surface powered by our lasers to suck in the atmosphere and compress it into a liquid. This gets pumped into bullet-shaped tanks, which a mass driver shoots all the way to the red planet, where they explode and mix oh. with the oxygen. We've already been able to send individual missions to Saturn in just a few years. With enough resources, it should be possible to complete the task within two generations. Of course, it would be much more convenient to have nitrogen left over from terraforming Venus on the side. We explained this in detail in another video. Venus. So, about a century after the start of the terraforming process, we have a breathable atmosphere that has the right gases. If the liberated CO2 isn't enough to warm it up to temperatures we can stand, we just add some super greenhouse gases. Mars at this point resembles a black marble from all the cooling lava, spotted with growing oceans and red patches where the old surface remains untouched. It's still a wasteland, no better than a desert on Earth. Yeah, take notes, they're gonna we need, need this. We need to fill it with life. Gonna go make a planet. Challenge two, And I will be the king. Installing a biosphere on a new planet is very difficult. Unexpected interactions between species or sudden diseases can destabilize it to the point of collapse. We yeah. will probably begin by seeding our young oceans with phytoplankton. Without <sighs> competition, it would bloom rapidly, filling up the oceans to become the bottom of an aquatic food chain. They can be followed by tiny zooplankton, then by fish, maybe even sharks and whales. If things go well, life in the oceans will thrive. Life on land is harder. Plants need nutrient-filled ground to sink their roots into, but most of the surface is the congealed remains of lava and ash. We could wait for thousands of years for water and wind to grind it down into finer sands, or try to do it manually. But we want to be quick, and we have a big laser. Big Turning laser. the beam on and off in rapid succession would cause the ground to quickly heat up and contract, which breaks it into smaller and smaller pieces. Add a bit of water, and you get a sort of dark mud. Into this mud, we can mix fungi and nitrogen-fixing bacteria. They're able to absorb nitrogen and convert it into nitrate compounds to feed plants. The first plants we want to bring are native to volcanic islands on Earth, since they're perfectly suited to the laser blast Martian landscape. Oh, that makes Eventually, sense. Eventually, the enriched mud becomes the foundation for grasslands and forests. In mm. Mars's lower gravity, trees can become very tall very fast. Their roots gather the nutrients they need and then dig deeper to turn more rocks into soil, forming a self-sustaining ecosystem. At this point, we can slowly introduce more plant varieties, insects, and animals. Not mosquitoes, though. The new biosphere needs to be maintained to prevent it from falling out of balance. If plants grow too quickly and absorb too much carbon dioxide, the planet cools down too much. If key species die out, we could see populations collapse faster than they could recover. On Earth, other species would move in to fill the void, but our Martian biosphere is not as flexible. It takes hundreds, if not thousands of years before Mars becomes a stable environment. But eventually, the planet will have the potential to sustain large human colonies. With air, water, and food and available, we can, we can finally call Mars, black, blue, and green, our home. A giant volcanic island in space. Will it last, though? Challenge three, the long-term future. There is a problem we haven't addressed. Mars's core does not produce a magnetic oh. field, so it doesn't have enough protection Why from not? solar radiation or cosmic rays. This becomes dangerous for the long-term health oh. of Martian populations. So, as a final step, we need an artificial magnetic field. It doesn't have to be huge like Earth's. It just needs to deflect the solar wind enough so that it doesn't touch Mars. The easiest way is to construct a magnetic umbrella far ahead of Mars that splashes the solar wind to the sides. A big superconducting ring powered by nuclear facilities is all it takes. It's not it even would orbit at the Mars Sun L1 point, what keeping do you it mean? constantly in between the Sun and Mars we forgot and to protect install the new it? atmosphere. And that's it. Terraforming Mars would take some work, hefty resources, and probably a century or ten, but it would be the first time we've lived in a home designed and shaped solely by us and for us. A first step towards our future among the stars. The first step that we can already take down here on Earth is learning more about the physics and biology needed for such a project. 
To help you with that, we've created a series of lessons Whoa. to build your fundamental understanding of these topics. This sounds like an ad. Made in collaboration with our friend. Yeah, this is the ad. Black Another hole one. stars may have been the largest stars that ever existed. I didn't install the most magnetic update. Brighter than galaxies and you were know how than any our star magnets today worked. or that could ever <laughs> exist in the future. But besides their scale, what makes them special and weird is that deep inside, they were occupied by a cosmic parasite, an endlessly hungry black hole. Oh. How is that even possible? Yeah, because I was sick yesterday, so I haven't say. Black hole stars I almost take never the on Sunday as well. And go beyond to break everything we know about how stars form and grow. They were only possible during a short window of time in the early universe. But if they existed, oh. they would solve one of the largest mysteries of cosmology. Black What's hole that? stars were excessive any way you look at them. The most massive stars today may have about 300 solar masses. A black hole star had up to 10 million solar masses of nearly I pure hydrogen. Let's take a moment to look at what this means visually. The Sun, Wesson, and El Pegasi. The largest star. And finally, the black hole star. Its scale is beyond words. Over 800,000 times online. wider than our Sun. 380 times larger than the largest star we know today. And far below its surface is a black hole, growing rapidly as it devours billions upon billions of tons of matter oh, per second. Oh. Normally, stars are born Mom. from gigantic clouds, collections of thousands or millions of solar Sometimes masses I'm and a black hole when it eats food. In these clouds, matter starts to accumulate around the densest spots inside. As these spots get denser, their gravitational pull intensifies yeah, the and biggest they grow faster. In the world. Eventually, they generate so much heat right. and pressure that they ignite the fusion universe. reactions and a new star is born. But this puts a limit the on their size. Star. Nuclear fusion releases enough radiation energy that the surrounding gas cloud is blown away. The new baby star can't Ooh, gather more we. mass. From now on, the star is living on the edge between two forces. Gravity pulling in, trying to squash the star, and radiation created by fusion pushing outwards, trying to blow the star apart. Whoa. After millions or billions of years, the core runs out of fuel and the balance breaks, destroying the star. Oh, but that seems dangerous. But black stars were very, very different. The beasts of the beasts. early universe. A few hundred million years after the Big Bang, when the universe was much smaller, all the matter in existence was much more concentrated. Mm. The universe was much denser and hotter. Dark matter was a dominant player, forming giant structures called dark matter halos. These okay. dark matter halos were so massive that they pulled in and concentrated unimaginably gigantic amounts of hydrogen gas, becoming the birthplaces of the first stars and galaxies. Epic clouds of hydrogen formed, some as massive as 100 million suns, more bit. than the mass of small galaxies. In this unique environment that will never exist again, the enormous gravitational pull of the dark matter halos drew gas into its center and created extremely massive stars. As we said before, when a star is born, it blows away the gas cloud that created it. But mm. these titanic gas clouds in the early universe were so large and massive that even after their birth, more and more gas piled on the newborn star, making it grow to mm. unbelievable proportions. The young star is forced to grow and grow and grow, getting more and more massive, until in some cases, it reaches up to 10 million times the mass of our sun. Crushed by gravity, its core gets hotter and hotter, desperately pushing outwards, trying to blow itself apart, but no to no please. avail. There's too much mass Mom, and too can much I go pressure. to space? The balance space. is impossible to uphold. Uh, 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 like lucky. a supernova run fast forward, the core space. gets crushed into a black hole. Uh, no, Normally, it doesn't look safe. Today's stars go supernova, You're a black too hole fluffy. forms, and things calm down. I just don't but think it's a good case, idea for you to have a space survives power. its own death. A tremendous explosion rocks the star from the inside, but it's not enough. The star is so large and massive that not even a supernova can destroy it. But now it has a black it's hole for the capitals. <laughs> it's tiny, a few tens of uh, kilometers yet. in the center of a thing the size of the solar system. 
the monster grows. And I mean, when you think about it, stars are born from only rich people and can paint a lot of space at the moment. And so they also spin. When a black hole is born from the core of a star, it can keeps its angular space. momentum. This means that matter that gets drawn in doesn't just fall in a straight line, try to but eat instead it. begins orbiting the black hole in smaller and smaller circles, going faster and faster. The result is an accretion disk where gas orbits at nearly the speed of light. Only a small amount of gas actually falls in at I any given moment. Basically, no. black holes put a lot of food on the table go. and only nibble at it. But the matter trapped He's in the accretion disk doesn't have a good time. Friction and collisions between particles heated up to temperatures of millions of degrees. Actively feeding black holes have accretion disks that are incredibly hot and powerful. Yeah. This heat from the disk further restricts how much a black hole can devour, just like the core of stars. The super hot material creates radiation that blows away most of the food within its reach. So even if a black hole had access to as much food as it desired, it can only grow slowly. Yeah. A black hole embedded inside a black hole star is different. The enormous pressure surrounding it pushes down matter directly into the black hole, oh. overcoming all restrictions on how fast it can consume. This process is so violent uh -huh. and releases yeah, so, so much energy that higher. the accretion disk becomes hotter and releases more radiation pressure than any star I core ever this could. For like 10 years Enough to, to push to back that. against the weight of 10 million suns. An impossibly dangerous balance has been created. Millions of soda masses pushing in. A black hole the angry radiation it. of a force-fed <laughs> black hole pushing out. <laughs> For the next few million years, really the black no. hole star is consumed from within. The black hole grows to thousands of solar masses, and the bigger it gets, oh. the faster it eats, which heats up the star even more and causes it to expand. In its final phase, the black hole star has become over 30 times wider than our solar system, truly That's the largest big. star to ever exist in the universe. The intense magnetic fields at its core spew out jets of plasma from the black hole's poles, which pierce through the star and shoot out into space, turning it into a cosmic beacon. It must have been one Probably of the most awe-inducing sights to ever exist in the universe. But this also marks the end. It becomes too stretched oh. and the accretion disk within too powerful. The parasite destroys its host, blowing it apart. Oh. A black hole with the mass of 100,000 suns rips its way out to hunt for new prey while leaving behind nothing but a star carcass. The supermassive question. Do you think they could be sentient? If black hole stars existed, they could explain one of the greatest mysteries of the universe. The supermassive black holes we see at the center of galaxies are just too big. They shouldn't be possible. Black holes born from regular supernovas can be a few tens of solar masses at most. And because of the process we explained before, they grow slowly after that. If black holes merge, they can form slightly larger black holes of over a hundred solar masses. It should take billions and billions of years to make black holes with hundreds of thousands or even millions of solar masses. Mm. And yet, we know that some supermassive black holes already had 800 million solar masses only 690 million years after the Big Bang. Black hole stars are a sort of black hole cheat code. If they formed very early in our so universe, very dense. and the black holes that emerged from them were thousands like stupid of solar literally. masses, then they could be the seeds for supermassive black holes. These seeds could take root in the center of the earliest galaxies, merging with others, and drawing in enough matter to grow quickly and reliably. Mm. Very soon, we may be able to verify their Jeez. past existence. The James Webb Space Telescope is turning its sensors to explore the farthest reaches of the universe, looking back in time, back to the early universe that we couldn't see before. Isn't everything so, we look out luck, to older to than witness glimpses of these than tragic when we see titans it? in the brief moment the between light. their formation and destruction? Until then, let's do the visual journey again, just for fun. Stars are big, black hole stars Ink. bigger.
but still not as big as your mom. <laughs> what the fuck? Oi! Planning a long-term project like the James Webb Space Telescope requires some serious <laughs> budgeting. But even personal finances are a nightmare to manage on your own. How That's dare you? To introduce you to Rocket Money, the sponsor of today's video. Just as space exploration projects ah, are planned by professionals, your finances deserve professional attention too. Me, I'm allergic to sponsorship, sorry. You are cells, your muscles, organs, skin, and hair. They are in your blood and in your bones. What? Cells are biological robots. They don't want anything. They I'm don't so feel anything. Little robots? They are never sad or happy. They just are, right here, right now. Uh. They're as conscious as a stone or a chair or a neutron star. Cells just follow their program that's out. been evolving and changing <laughs> for billions of years, molded by natural selection. They are impossible machines, and yet, here they are, driven entirely by the fundamental forces of the universe. Oh. The smallest unit of life, right at the border where physics becomes biology. Sometimes, to get a truer understanding of how amazing something is, you need to hold your breath and dive in. You are cute deep. and adorable and deserve so, so much love ourselves? and support. And Fuma. how do they work? Wow. Thank you. So it... We're also covered in holes. Look around the room you're sitting in right now. That also upsets me. Let's fill it top me, to bottom really? with trillions of grains of sand, billions of grains of rice, hundreds of thousands of Oh no, of don't grapes, do that. That's a, a terrible mix. No. And a dozen watermelons. What? This Why? is what the inside of your cells looks like. Oh. In terms of numbers, they're mostly filled up with water molecules, the grains of sand. Water gives the cells insides the consistency of soft jelly no, and sandy enables apple other things grape to rice. move around easily. We need to get all the other things, the rice and fruit, are proteins. Several billion in total, more than 10,000 different kinds, depending on the function of the cell. Your cells are basically protein robots, as is all life, really. In fact, all solid, non-fat parts of your body are mostly made out of protein, even your bones. Oh. Proteins are dead things that make life happen. Whoa. How does this work? The language of life. Nice. Cells need to do many very hard things to stay alive. So the work is great. Get food in and waste out, grow and build structures, escape danger or react to stimuli, make copies of themselves, and so on. All of this is done by speaking the language of life. And the words of this language are proteins. This is how this language works in a nutshell. That one looks like poop. It all begins with amino acids, tiny organic molecules. They're the alphabet of the language of life. There are 21 different ones, like different letters. Amino oh. acid A, amino acid B, C, and so on. Mm. If you put around 50 amino acids together, they form a protein, which in the language of life okay, is a like, word. Like eggs and have if a you lot put of protein. many of these protein words together, you get a sentence called okay. a biological pathway. Let's oversimplify a bit Chicken. and say, for example, your cell needs to break down sugar with the language of life. It may take the amino like acids eggs. for the letters B, R, E, A, and K to form <laughs> the protein word break. Then combine this word with other protein words to form a biological pathway sentence that means break down break sugar. Down sugar. Yeah, In break reality, it down, sugar. this language of life is so complex that it defies imagination. You need to know about 8,000 words to speak a human language really well. But in the language of life, there are an estimated 20,000. Oh. And while the average English word has five letters, human proteins have an average of 375 amino acids. The longest protein has more than 30,000. And cells need to execute thousands of steps at any moment. If they ever stop speaking the language of life, they die. Oh, don't do okay. that. But how do mindless cells speak a language this complex? Let's dive a little deeper. There are 21 amino acids that can be combined to form proteins. And proteins oh. are made up of dozens now to I'm hundreds smiling. to thousands of amino acids. Oh, yes, yes. For the <laughs> average protein length of a human cell of 375 amino acids, you get a stunning 6.8 times 10 to the power of 495 possible proteins your cells can make. A quadrillion Google, 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 Google times Google, more Google, than there are Google, atoms Google. in the universe. Most of these possible proteins are useless. Just like with human language, most random letter combinations are just gibberish. 
so you need to know which words, which proteins, make up a language to speak it properly. And this is the job of your DNA, a long sequence of instructions. If you untangled a cell's DNA, it would be about two meters long. All of you your body's your DNA pants? combined into one long string Wait, would reach to the sun it. and back over 20 times. Around 1% of your oh, DNA is made up of genes, well, which it. are basically protein dictionaries that contain all the words of the language of life your cells speak. But genes are also oh, the building manuals for, for some all reason. the proteins your cells it. need to function. Go ahead, beat me the up rest with of cams. your DNA Do it. is probably I, not useless, I, I, I but basically like a set you. of rules. It's like the book of grammar of the language of life. Which proteins Why need to be built big? at which time? How many of them do you need? Which protein words go together and why? Okay, Ow. letters, words, sentences, dictionary, and grammar. But of course, hey, this okay, is all just a metaphor for Ow. something mind-numbingly complex. Let's dive a little deeper to catch a glimpse of reality. How dead Ow. proteins make life. Now that we have some uh, basic principles, we mine? have a chance to understand how dead things make life learn. together. Ow. And for that, we need a fundamental force of the universe, electromagnetism. The elementary particles that make up atoms, which make up amino acids, have different charges that attract or repel each other. The 21 different amino acids all have slightly different charges. Some are more negative, others more positive. When your cells build proteins, they put different amino acids together in chains, wow. basically long strings. Now, because of the different charges of the amino acids used, these strings begin to fold in on Think themselves. Chocolate nuts? This Why folding you process chocolate is so nuts? complex that we still haven't completely understood fuck? how exactly it works. But in a nutshell, 1D strings oh, become oh. 3D structures. Like that. Proteins are basically 3D puzzle pieces with a very specific Ooh, shape. Oh, I like puzzles. In the world of proteins, shape is everything. Because its 3D shape determines which areas of a protein are charged in which way, and this determines how it can interact with other proteins. All of these differently charged puzzle pieces can snap dude. together or repel each other. When they snap together, their charge changes, which can make them change their shape, which then makes them a new protein, a new tool I think that can have do a little brain things. damage. This is what makes proteins so incredibly powerful. You can do basically but I might have had that already. They can snap together like Lego pieces to build complex structures. Uh, they can dismantle things. Think of a they can form complex micro machines <laughs> that use energy to do work. And maybe most stunningly, they can They're convey information. Let's say there's a toxic chemical entering your cell. There may be a protein oh, no. shaped to snap to that toxin. If the protein finds that toxin, it changes its so, shape. Wait, what's the with that new shape it can now What's the difference between proteins and protein like chicken? Now snap into a different protein that changes its shape again. This new protein activates a micro machine that directly binds to your DNA to order the production of a special protein which acts as an antidote to the toxin. This cascade of Are interaction is the pathway we spoke about earlier, a sentence in the language of life. So, without a single active thought, proteins have fixed a problem and saved the cell's life. In reality, these pathways can have dozens to hundreds of steps. How life operates ah, is so incredibly okay. awe-inducing. Somehow, mind-numbingly complex interactions between dumb and dead proteins create a less dumb and less dead cell. Somewhere oh. around here, life happens. But we still don't know what life is how dumb things are smart together. We need another analogy, so let's talk about ants. Ants share a fundamental property with cells, uh. they are really dumb. A single ant will just stumble around uselessly, but if you put a lot of ants together, they exchange information and do amazing things. Constructing complex structures, organizing themselves, caring for broods, or attacking enemies. Although dumb individually, together they become something greater. This phenomenon occurs all over nature and is called emergence. It's the observation that entities have properties I and abilities that their parts do not dumb have. Dumb tick -tick. This is how everything in your body works. Your cells are bags of proteins you are guided on by Twitch. chemistry. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But together, these proteins form Actually, a living being a lot that can do a lot of people. really sophisticated things. Cells are mindless robots that are even dumber than ants. But many of like them acting monk. together form specialized tissue and organ systems 
from muscles that make mm. your heart beat to brain cells that make you think. If you look outside at what the if we're all a bunch of cells of space, a and the universe are cells in a, a giant thing. body? It's almost impossible we not think to feel we're being small, smart, but actually we're just but if you look inside into what you really in are, you just machine. discover almost indescribable like the little complexity. Ones in us. The beautiful language of life. Almost everything in the universe reveals hidden layers of complexity if you look closer, and if you have the knowledge to understand it. To help you with that, we've created <laughs> a series of lessons to take your scientific knowledge to the next level. Oh, brilliant! There's hey, uh, this idea floating around that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That surviving a disease leaves you better off. And it seems to make Why sense because we've all time? experienced this. When you go through hardship, often you come out more resilient, more ready to face a difficult situation in the future. But it turns out that sometimes what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Oh, like long so COVID. what happens when you get sick? I never got COVID either. The machinery of war. Think of yourself as a large country with a sizable army to defend it. You're surrounded by enemies that want to take your land, your energy, your resources. This is a matter of life and death, so your body evolved to be sensitive to damage and to the presence of enemies. Because this means that an invasion might happen at any moment and that it has to act fast. Let's start an invasion and see what happens. Yo, I the love moment your cells notice that something is off, they release an onslaught of signal proteins called cytokines. They're like air raid sirens that activate all sorts of immune cells that then themselves release many more cytokines, amplifying the alarm. Whoa. Soon, you're flooded with signals that trigger precautions and countermeasures. Mobilization is underway. Your brain activates sickness behavior oh God. and reorganizes your body's priorities to defense. <laughs> That's terrifying. The first thing you notice is that your energy level drops and you get sleepy. You feel apathetic, often anxious or down, and you lose your appetite. Mm. Your sensitivity to pain is heightened uh, I'll be honest and you though. seek out rest. When All I get sick, I get hungry. to save your energy and reroute it into your immune response. You become a country under attack, switching into a war economy because properly activating your immune system is intensely disruptive and draining. Just like war is expensive for a country as industry switches to building tanks, your immune system demands huge amounts of energy, oh. amino acids, and micro elements to build its weapons. Take fever. It speeds up your metabolism and makes your cells work harder and faster while creating heat that's pretty stressful for many invaders, but it uses up a lot of calories to maintain. Then your immune system begins to clone millions of specialized immune cells to respond specifically to the enemy infecting you. B cells produce millions of antibodies every second, each requiring hundreds of amino acids to construct. Billions or even trillions of proteins need to be made to refresh mm. the complement system, a minefield inside your blood. Cytokines, the mobilization and information signals, they also like need constant butts. refreshing. Usually, you acquire your resources by eating. But when you're sick, your body slows down your digestion because it needs a lot of energy you can't spare. So it reaches for the easiest you source of amino acids and starts what? breaking down your muscles. All that muscle That's that crazy. you worked so hard for is sacrificed to keep you alive. If you're young and healthy and fit, yes. you'll make up for that quickly once you're better. But if you're old or very young, weak or suffer from chronic illness, this may be way too draining. Spider your body is literally around. consuming Ooh, itself to keep pretty. the defense going. If your whole system is already strained, when you get sick, just keeping your immune responses going can overwhelm your capacities. I was sick all the time as a kid. Your immune system is a jerk. Our enemies too. But I don't really get your cold immune stuff system these is days. as dangerous to Often. you as it is to enemies. I just There's get a very sick fragile balance between reasons. the damage caused by an infection and the collateral damage caused by immune this cells. Is stuff I have One of your than, first like, responders something. are neutrophils. Imagine crazy aggressive chimps with machine guns. Okay. If a neutrophil encounters enemies, it showers them with chemicals that cut them open, but can also damage oh. civilian cells, especially if the patient is already compromised, for example, by smoking. On top oh, no. of that, the microorganisms that invade you often release chemicals and toxins that can cause significant damage and cell death. So a serious infection often causes many tiny wounds, literally holes in your organs. 
As you can imagine, holes? it's not great to have holes and wounds in your organs. I don't want holes in my organs. Your neutrophils and macrophages help Why the monkey by releasing chemicals that organs? signal the body to start repairs, and most of the damage is quickly filled up with regrowing cells. But others are filled with collagen, a sort of fixal organic cement that gives your gooey tissue structural integrity. You've seen the result in your skin as scars. A scar is different oh. from the original tissue. It has no functioning cells in it. It's like a sloppily applied cement patch. It can't do what the original tissue was doing. A scar on your heart I makes it beat a tiny scars. bit weaker. A scar on the lungs no longer captures oxygen. A scar on your liver makes it a worse filter. And so as you go through life and survive serious disease after serious disease, the functionality of your organs may decrease. The damage is usually small enough not to affect your quality of life, but can be permanent. Okay, this sounds depressing, but there is actually something you can do to avoid a lot of this damage and train your immune system. Oh. The best way to train your immune system. <laughs> your immune system is unique. Everyone has a slightly different immune system that's stronger against some enemies and weaker against others, which makes evolutionary sense as this protects our species from being wiped out by a single infection. Collectively, mm. the immune system of the human species is a spectrum. Most people respond well enough to an infection, a few are super responders, and a few It's like that one island of people that haven't had well interaction with anyone die. for years, Some aren't immune to like anything. The Black Death, are more resistant to HIV or coronavirus, or even resistant against Ebola. Others are killed easily by the flu, or are highly vulnerable to certain bacterial infections. Where you are on this spectrum is impossible to predict, and you also respond differently to every possible infection. This is why seemingly very healthy young people died from COVID, while for some elderly people, it was more like a mild flu. The idea that you can weather all sorts of diseases if you never get a cold is wrong. You never know what your immune system is good at until mm -hmm. it's tested. Getting sick is a gamble in get most casinos with easily. your health on the line. Always. But there is something you can do. Hacking one of the best features of your immune system. Well, when you survive a man. disease, usually you have better defenses against it afterwards. You gain memory cells that are very good at killing the specific enemy you fought that day. So you either don't get the disease again, or the for? next infection is much milder. And you can use an incredible achievement of human ingenuity that taps into this mechanism to Vaccine. prevent damage from disease and train your immune system. Mm -hmm. Vaccines. Vaccines basically pretend to be a disease and train your defenses to be ready if it ever shows up for real. The goal is to create the same memory cells that you would get after surviving an infection. But if you can feel some side effects, why should you still do it? Well, Nature versus the big vaccine one. dojo. You have two options to train your immune system, vaccine dojo and nature dojo. In vaccine dojo, you train with paper weapons and learn to defend yourself. Sure, you might get a black eye or a bruise. Sometimes after a vaccine, like you get sick a slime for a few days, but that's generally it. it. No scars, no permanent damage. We discussed vaccine How side explosive. effects in detail in another video, if you want to learn more. On the other hand, getting a disease to become immune means going to a nature dojo. In nature dojo, you train with real weapons, sharp knives, and swords. Things might still work out, but with way more cuts and wounds. But from time to time, someone will die, be it a kid from measles or an adult from influenza. Nature Dojo is just way more risky. On top of that, the immunity you get from a vaccine is often better than the natural resistance because they're engineered to engage your immune system in a more productive way. Of course, vaccines are not magic, and sometimes they mm -hmm. don't protect us as well as we'd like them to. Maybe because an enemy mutates too quickly, like the Omicron coronavirus, or because your specific immune system does not respond well to the vaccine and builds less of a defense. Still, being vaccinated is one of the best tools to train your natural defenses. In the end, if we look at the stunning progress humanity has made in the last century, eventually we may overcome Wait, what disease there? for good. But until then, we can do our best to take care of ourselves and others. Your body and your Use older self gym. will be grateful to you. Diseases are not the only problem humanity can address if we work together. We believe the same is true for climate change, one of the main challenges of our generation. Well, and then it's the same ad as uh, before. We've seen this exact.